Thank you very much for the opportunity to give this talk. I would like to introduce to you the material science and engineering community and how it will interact uh, between solid state physics and uh, let's say material science related topics there uh, up to the engineering side. Um, material science and engineering is pretty much very interdisciplinary. It was always built up uh, in terms of the community by chemists, by physicists, by by mechanics engineering guys, uh, real material scientists, uh, which uh, closely work on the mechanisms and so on, but also testing and everything is very important. So it's rather uh, interdisciplinary and therefore it's very interesting to see how we connect uh, in the future in terms of a um, information infrastructure between all the different subjects. That's what we believe is one of the stepping stones in terms of the digital transformation that me, we make the move uh, going from, let's say, data to information and how that is transferred between different subjects without losing information. To the aims of the material science and engineering uh, community are to accelerate uh, the materials development not only, let's say, from an atomistic point of view, but also how to make them. Um, there's another step is the flexibilization of production. So in terms of Industry 4.0 and every all the other efforts which are going on, and in terms of reliability within the application. Nevertheless, this is picking out some parts of the real lifetime of the material which you know goes from cradle to cradle so that's really what we're going after in the end. Now connecting this production in terms of engineering again with physics in terms of what does the electronic structure give me as a starting point for my material and how to make it really in a turbine blade which then runs for 10,000 hours or something like that. That's the big question of we try to solve and which we try to uh, give a certain structure in, so, in terms of the information so that we can follow all that path through the lifetime of a material. Now there are different initiatives in terms of the European Commission. It's the Horizon 2020 program, uh, which ends soon. There's a new one coming up. There will be also material science and engineering in there. There's the German Science Foundation, which is uh, currently organizing the national science research uh, infrastructure, data infrastructure initiative. There are different ministries which have programs out there, for example, the Mat Material Di Digital or Material Digital in Germany, um, which is trying to uh, start a platform and different projects on it, but it's rather applied. So there will be also projects with industry in the second, uh, in the second uh, wave. And there's, for example, different initiatives from Max Planck, from Helmholtz, from Fraunhofer uh, and so on. Um, altogether, these are very many possibilities to really come up with ways of this uh, digital transformation, but there's not that many of them are really focusing on bringing the community together. We believe the NFDI is one of these possibilities. Um, in terms of the NFDI for MSE, we have a consortium which is rather uh, going from the subject discussed in this conference, uh, focusing on solid state physics and material science on the electronic structural level as well as molecular dynamics. But uh, we try to bridge that gap up to the application which and its production uh, together with the engineers. So we see uh, our community as a bridge builder between the different communities, there's also chemistry and mathematics and so on. And that all together gives us a, a rather rich field of uh, interests and it's interesting to build that consortium. Nevertheless, the, the community itself comes from all over Germany and as I said, uh, it's different universities. Um, there are different um, institutions from Max Planck, Helmholtz, uh, Leibniz, uh, Fraunhofer, the BAM, uh, and so on involved. And it's a, it's a very interesting and, and uh, um, so I think successful uh, motion we set in place. Now, um, 
altogether this won't work if we wouldn't work together with other uh, NFDI uh, consortia and this is shown here on the one hand side so there's a Fermat um, which has been presented um, in this conference there's Mardi, Mardi is uh, pretty much the mathematics guys uh, which are very important for our um, mechanics um, which is pretty much applied mathematics it's complicated nonlinear discussions uh, going on, uh, nonlinear mechanics and so on. There's data plan for biomaterials, bioprocessing, stuff like that. There's the NFDI for ING. The NFDI for ING is uh, pretty much the engineering uh, overarching consortium. It doesn't touch really into the depth of, of e each of the fields in, in engineering, but it gives an, uh, a framework where, where um, all these fit in. And then there's NFDI for physics, which is developing still, and NFDI for chem, which is pretty far ahead and uh, might get funded soon. Altogether, there are a lot of different societies surrounding us, and um, uh, without reading through all of them, they are national, international, and um, they give us also a lot of possibilities to interact uh, with the whole crowd worldwide. Now, what's it all about? Let's, let's take a look at what we try to accomplish here. Now, what you can see here is pretty much the engineering side of a turbine blade, uh, a turbine blade which is pretty much in the very hot section of a turbine. Now, uh, you could say, okay, this is old tech because it's burning carbon-based fuel, yes, but the carbon-based fuel has a freaking high um, energy density and therefore we'll probably will stay with that. Uh, it's a question if we dig it out of the earth or if we really take it, let's say, from biofuels and, and bioprocessing. Now let's take a look. And, and what we can see here is, is the turbine blade itself. It has a lot of holes, coolings, uh, cooling areas and so on. It has a complex geometry in terms of fluid dynamics. So this is all the engineering part. And then the material science part starts pretty much on a relatively rough uh, surface uh, scale. So it's the continuum which we are interested in, how that behaves, and we give that directly to the engineers. But it's fed by the internal defects, uh, which we can, for example, access by phase field, but also molecular dynamics, uh, as well as on the electronic level. Now, what you saw is not only simulations, but this is the real uh, experiment and you go down with the TEM, you go to uh, look at it with the SEM, you have all kinds of different techniques and in the end you want to bring experiments and simulation together on a data basis and then you use data-based material science approaches to really understand what's going on. These materials you see here they typically take uh, from the making the first material to up to the point where it ends in the turbine, roughly 30 years. And we try to bring that down to, let's say, 10. Maybe at some point we can do it in five, and we will see. But I think we will really need it if we want to make it through the next, uh, let's say, 50 years as humankind, because the world will change pretty fast. And now, if we look at the material science, we have all these different size scales. And the second part then is that the volume elements also behave very different. So depending on which property you are interested in, like a melting temperature, the density, which is important for the loading conditions in such a turbine blade, the elastic modulus, the stiffness, which is extremely important, the thermal conductivity, uh, permeability, the yield strength, creep strength, fracture toughness, ductility or fatigue life, that, de that depends pretty much on different size scales where you look at the volume element to really get a representative experiment and simulation. So you can see that here now, this is uh, done by Eklin, you can read that up and um, it's for their case how they ordered it and I would say for the most high temperature materials it's pretty pretty accurate in terms of what kind of size scale we're dealing with. Now fatigue life, for example, uh, th since I'm in reliability also working quite a bit, it, it's really tough to get a good estimate and a prediction what the lifetime might be uh, if you have such a complex material. 
and um, that's really something which differs quite a bit from let's say simulating an elastic modulus because anything in between is interacting uh, heavily with each other so dislocation structures and everything forms and then at some point a crack forms but it might not win because of the microstructure and the next strain and so on so this is complicated and we're trying to inch closer to really get uh, predictive models which are realistic for complex microstructures and that's also one of the points in terms of high performance materials they are never in the equilibrium Never. Typically, we're far from the thermodynamic uh, dynamic equilibrium state, and the microstructure itself is typically strongly path dependent in terms of the processing steps. So, how was it made? If I mix up anything in between, it will change completely and my properties are gone. And that means we need to be able to really transfer the information about each little step within uh, a data structure and within an information structure or infrastructure. So what is shown here is a very simple example. You come from the le upper left side and you go through a manufacturing process where, for example, there's, it's a turning process, there's a turning machine involved, and it's, it's a sample manufacturing. You get a specimen out of your material, you give it a name, you know roughly what the material is, you know the material class, for example, it's nickel base, super alloy. You, you go for, for a tensile test <clears throat> where there's a test machine, testing machine involved. You get out of that tensile test, which is green and therefore it's a process, you get out a specimen, an object, it's a broken specimen so the state is broken and so on and you can get data files you get information about the process and so on you can add all these things without uh, interrupting the, your your environment your data on information environment so that's not, you don't care if it's a dot file or an ascii file uh, or if it's in excel or if it's let's say just a script which spits out the right numbers at the time now, in the end, you want to do a data analyzer, which is also a process. You get out your Young's modulus and your yield stress. And if we look at it uh, more or less from a different point of view, we typically have on the left hand side, it's our workshop, which makes samples. Um, then we have our sample testing, we have our expert analysis and reporting. Pretty much the same happens in simulation. We typically prepare a system, we fix the boundary conditions, we make everything sure that the experiment can work, we put it into our simulation um, code, we get a certain amount of data out of it, we analyze it. So it's nothing really only experiment or simulation, you can pretty much uh, do these things uh, with any workflow you have. Nevertheless, all these words we use here are partially standardized, mostly not, which means that if you have three different codes and you tell them to access a database like that through a network graph, data structure or something like that, that will be not successful right now. We hope that we get together and figure out how to do that properly um, if we work together. Now, nevertheless, this would be just a workflow. So, let me recapture what we have. Typically we have, for example, images or we have data sets from simulation, from experiments and so on. And this is data. Uh, we, we use metadata to describe that. And if we run that properly um, and, and try to come together as communities and, and really bring that together, this might be uh, giving us a data structure which is really um, standardized where everybody knows how to describe data. Nobody tells you what you should put into your data or what experiment you should do. That needs to be absolutely flexible. We are scientists and therefore we want full flexibility, but how to describe it, that can be standardized. Similar to SI. And if we look at then uh, an example, um, we can extract from that data information by building, for example, a 3D microstructure out of the data, out of slices of images, or uh, let's say metadata, which is fed into that, into that workflow. We can use that with a certain knowledge to really get not only information, but somehow a little bit of knowledge. 
it's a prediction of what could happen. So on the right hand side you can also see that there's an experiment and there's a simulation going on because we know about the material models. We can predict roughly how the material will behave if we, if we have an idea of what to expect from the plasticity, for example, how the interfaces uh, between the different phases are reacting and how the matrix is deforming under stress. And this is shown on the right hand side. So what has been put in here is that we use um, in the simulation the real microstructure as shown as the cube. And then we put in a couple of things like thermodynamics, but mostly the Young's modulus, plastic deformation, uh, the, um, the yield strength, the, the hardening coefficients and, and things like that. And therefore we get uh, the information of how that should behave. We can validate that with the experiment in that case. It pretty much is a lot of understanding which goes in there because from, from that we can not only uh, put in, let's say, this local information, but we get that interplay out of it and we can then predict how it will behave in co under completely different loading conditions. And this is something we have trouble accessing through experiments. And on the right hand side uh, is shown in three different directions how the stress how the yield, uh, yield surface will be looking like depending on my microstructure. And I can now vary that microstructure and get different um, surface planes or surface uh, structures for uh, the yield stress. Now, this is still not the main Haley Gr uh, Holy Grail, but really we want to come to predictive maintenance. And that pretty much means that we have to not only predict for a specific microstructure how it will behave, but continuously being able to say, if you load it this way, if this happens, if you uh, run it for that long of a time, then you will get a mechanism kicking in, maybe introducing a crack, uh, breaking your sample or your application and that really is important to us. The same is true for materials development. Um, if we not only optimize the development for one specific functionality or property, but uh, in, in a very uh, complex uh, environment where, where different properties are relevant uh, for a successful application. Now, this is pretty much what we understand in terms of uh, wisdom. It means to, to know the right thing to do. So where should I look for the next material? And I think many of the talks have described how to do that with uh, data science and in combination with uh, simulations. And um, therefore I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. Anyway, um, if we now look at what we have to do to really get to that point, it's uh, the development of uh, digital workflows and the digital infrastructure. So going from um, the, um, let's say, uh, data acquisition in terms of experiments, simulation, or in terms of sensing, in the end, it's, it's nothing um, different in a, in a company or in a turbine, which is running then from the experimental lab uh, just the boundary conditions are different and, and also how close I can get to the materials property uh, might be very different. Nevertheless, uh, we need to be able to really save that. We need to be able to, to uh, run through our workflows to really get the properties we want. And last but not least, we want to get a data analysis and um, understanding from, from all that workflow. And in the future, uh, one of the things which really needs to be done is how to automize data generation, processing, experimentation and simulation and so on. That only works if, if all these workflows elements are machine readable in the end. We want to fill in missing uh, data. Uh, we want to, through virtual testing, for example, uh, we want to establish materials data spaces containing all the materials history and predict the future. Now, 
developing that structural data space uh, uh, is, is, as I described before, um, depending on the case. Again, I'm not repeating myself here, but just to give you an idea, this is really data which we store typically in Excel because our technicians want to open the data and check it and, and just run a first course right there in the lab. Later on, it's transferred again into uh, ASCII files, which can be read in and by different Python scripts or anything like that. Nevertheless, to, to really go into uh, the development on, of an ontology, there are different options. One of them is the basic form of ontology, which is an upper level ontology, but allows quite a bit of, uh, uh, let's say, standardization in terms of workflows. If we just do that, that's already a huge benefit because uh, that would mean that we uh, will be able to uh, have really fair data sets and um, that is would be an improvement quite a bit from from today so therefore with all these things said i i would like to just show you a workflow um, example and uh, that's just uh, going from let's say casting process down to let's say making small samples which we can check what the microstructure is we polish we edge we uh, put them into the optical microscope and this is just such a simple task our PhD students do, our, our HIVs are doing, our students are doing. And, and still there are so many different uh, metadata which are involved and it's a, a pure labor process. Sometimes we can automize quite a bit of it, but not all. And, and many of these informations are lost. And for example, the etching technique and how you apply it has such a big uh, influence on what kind of microstructure you see in the end that if we don't have that, it's pretty much not very likely that you get out of the images a proper uh, information. Now, while this is nice, uh, as I said before, we really want to go for a different level. And this means we want a digital representation, which means at least the knowledge about materials needs to be represented. So on the one hand side, there's this holistic approach that we say, okay, we want to save everything and be able to extract everything again. The other one is what kind of relevant materials information do I re need right now? And um, what we really want to have is not only a property, but the behavior and not only in the lab, but also in applications in the end. So in a complex environment and information on processing and loading is therefore very important. To put a little bit more info of information in there, we also work together with the European Materials Modeling Ontology Group. Um, there are a couple of people on here, as you can see, and it's not only state, but also the heat treatment, so the process in there, the properties are in there, but this is not uh, um, explaining anything why that happens. So why would be you have to introduce something about the microstructure and how we interpret that? The whole patch equation, for example, is a concept. There's, it's, it's a very simplified concept of how the grain size of a material will affect your yield stress. But still, this is important to implement. And as you can see here, that might be a way to, to really bring an equation into uh, an ontology. And if we go even a little bit further, we might be able to put in also the math so that it's really machine readable as an equation. Now, this is not even close to official. This is pretty much what we tried and figured out that this needs to be stored at one point, And we hope to be able to do that together with our math uh, colleagues. In the end, we do that in the analog way. We have uh, two dimensions and we have all the different things added to it so that we can work on it uh, in real time. The, the whole story is therefore, we need to standardize data, software interface, infrastructure. We need to know the domain knowledge integration. We have to have simple data storage and access. And we need something like a seamless knowledge transfer between people, between subjects and between the different, um, uh, let's say, um, size scales and so on. And therefore, we believe that this can be only mastered if we work together. And I hope you all join into the digital transformation. Thank you very much.